Hello and welcome to the New Yankee Workshop, Season 3, Episode 11, The Cricket Table. An unusual piece, the hardwood cricket table features three angled legs. Norm demonstrates the complex angle mortise and tenon joinery necessitated by this configuration using a set of jigs to make sure all the pieces fit together properly. Enjoy! This place is great. It's filled with wonderful antiques and over here is a piece I want you to see. This cricket table. It has three legs, a shelf down below, but I'll tell you, it is rude and crude as far as construction. It has a wonderful patina on the wood, something that might be a little difficult to duplicate, but one thing is for sure, I know we can build this table. I'd also like to take a moment to talk about shop safety. Be sure to read, understand, and follow all the safety rules that come with your power tools. Knowing how to use your power tools properly will greatly reduce the risk of personal injury. And remember this, there is no more important safety rule than to wear these safety glasses. Now I'll show you how I built today's project. Well, here's our version of that cricket table. And I made mine out of oak because I'm going to use it in my office where I already have an oak sofa. And I think I'll put a small TV on the top and then on the shelf down below, I think I'll put my answering machine. Now I stuck to the details of the original pretty much, except for this shelf right here. On the original, the end grain of the boards showed. And I don't think that was very attractive, so I've recessed it. Now as I started to work on the prototype, I discovered one important point, and that's that this base is an isosceles triangle, which means that all three sides are equal. And even though it's tapered, it's really not that difficult to build. Now, when I went down to my hardwood center, I was lucky. I was able to get the whole top out of one board, one 10-foot length of 1 by 8. And that's an advantage because it means that the texture of the grain is going to be more even and match up. Now, the next thing that I did is look at the ends of the boards for the growth rings. You can see this board, they're curving up. This one down, up, down. By alternating those rings, I'll end up with a more stable top. Now I've got them laid out, and the next thing is to just mark them so they'll stay in the same orientation. One witness mark across that joint, two here, three here. Now, looking at the joints, they're not bad. Let's see if we can improve them. Oh, now that is a nice, tight joint. See what a great job that tool does? Now, as you might expect, I'm going to reinforce all these joints with some biscuits. And the first thing I have to do is do the layout. Now, because this is going to be a circular top, I don't want any biscuits too far out where they might show when I cut it. So what I've done is established the center point approximately for the table. And using my tape, I'm marking where the edge might be, about a 29-inch diameter. I make sure that there's no biscuit in beyond that area. So I'll come back about three and a half inches, and then I'll mark about every eight inches. Well, there's nothing tricky about this step. The idea is to get glue on every surface, on the biscuits, and in the slots. Okay, the last board to go on. Now just put a little clamp pressure on these and it'll be dry in no time. Let's start working on the legs. But first, I'm going to take a tracing of the actual footprint on this piece of paper so I can show you what it's like. Okay, now I have to extend these because they've been sanded. But this angle right here is 60 degrees, the outer corner of the leg. And as it goes along the side, it comes to a 90 degree corner on this side and a 90 degree corner on this side. And that's so that when the rails are installed, they'll be square to the leg. And this angle right here is 120 degrees. Now to make the legs, I picked up a piece of oak at my hardwood outlet that's about two and a half inches thick. And the first thing I want to do is rip three strips two inches wide. Okay, now with my saw blade tilted to a 30 degree angle, 
and my rip fence moved over so that I'll get two and a quarter inches to the long point. I'm going to rip each piece, and that'll give me the sharp angle or the outside of the corner of the leg. Now the next cut will be 90 degrees to the cut that I just made. The blade stays at 30 degrees, but I've moved the fence on the other side. As with both cuts, I'm leaving a little bit of extra material so I can plane it smooth later. Let's look at the prototype. The legs flare out at a slight angle. And what that means is that the cut at the bottom of the leg and the top of the leg is not 90 degrees, it's just a little angle. In fact, it's seven and a half degrees. I'll make the cuts on the radial arm. I can't just put the leg against the fence and cut it because the angle won't be right. The leg needs to be in a position like this, the sharp point down, the center line being perfectly vertical. So I've made an accessory for the fence. It's just a piece of scrap wood, cut at a 30 degree angle, and that'll position the piece correctly. I've also tilted my blade to that seven and a half degrees. Now the length of my leg is 26 and a half inches from long point to short point. And I'm just going to slide my jig to the other side of the saw blade and make the other cut. Let's take a look at the prototype. Now that the legs have been cut to size, the next thing to do is to mortise for this lower rail and for the upper rail. I've laid out the location of each mortise and I'm going to use my drill press, which I've set up with a mortising attachment, which is simply a drill bit that runs through a square chisel. It's just an easy way of drilling square holes. and You've seen me use it before. Now I have to make a special jig. Because the top of the leg is cut at a seven and a half degree angle, I also want the mortise to be at a seven and a half degree angle. So I cut a wedge, which corresponds to the seven and a half degrees, and that'll position the leg correctly under the drill press. And I want to make sure that I hold the long side of the leg against the guide fence. Now this piece is simply there so it won't twist as I mortise it out. With the first set of mortises cut, I've got to modify my setup a little bit. So when I made those first cuts, you could see that the drill will travel parallel to that top cut. Now if I simply turn the leg around on my seven and a half degree block and try to do the adjacent mortise, you can see it runs away rather than parallel. And I can correct that problem by simply reversing the seven and a half degree block. Well, now it's time to start working on the rails. And the rails have tenons on each end, which fit into the mortises that I just cut in the legs. Now, the angle of the shoulder cut on the tenon, as well as the end of the rail itself, including the tenon, is seven and a half degrees, the same angle we've been using all along. Now, the length of the rails for the bottom, which support the shelf, is 22 and a quarter inches, including the tenons. And then I need three rails for the top of the table, and they're 18 and a half inches, including the tenons. Well, now I'm ready to start making the tenons on the end of the rails. So I've installed a stop block, and that controls the end, or the length of the tenon. I've put my stacked dado head cutter in, and I've swung the radial arm to seven and a half degrees. I've also carefully adjusted the height so that I remove just a quarter of an inch of material. Now with this setup, I'll be able to make one half of each tenon, and that's because of the angle. Now to cut the other side of each tenon, I'm going to have to swing my radial arm to seven and a half degrees on the other side of zero, flip over my stop block and reset it for length, carefully make a sample, and finish up those side cuts.
Now, using my bandsaw, I've made a couple cuts to give me the correct tenon height, which is an inch and a half. Now, there's another milling operation that I have to do to the lower rails. Because they follow the angle of the leg, if you want a nice flat top, it has to be beveled. Here you see if I put a straight edge, it fits flush. But if I take a rail that hasn't been beveled, you can see there's a gap there. We'll take care of that on the joiner. Now the adjustment to the joiner wants to be just a little under 5 degrees. Now there's just one more milling operation to be made on these lower rails. And that's a little rabbit to recess the boards from the shelf. Now, just like everything else in the project, it's not a simple rabbit. It has to be angled. The angle will be the same as the angle I used to bevel the top. So I've set up my table saw and tipped the angle to five degrees, just under five degrees. And now I'll make the inside cut on each rail. Okay, now I have to finish making that rabbit, which is to remove this piece of material right down here. So what I'm going to do is leave the saw at the same angle, but I'm going to move the rip fence over so it's about three-eighths of an inch away from the blade. I'm going to raise the blade just slightly and run it through. Before I can assemble the base, there's one more thing I have to do to the legs. When I looked at the original, I thought there was something wrong. It looked like the bottom of the legs were curved out. But as I studied it more closely and checked it, I noted that the outside of the leg was straight, just like I've made these. But that the inside of the leg was straight only from the top down to about the bottom of this lower shelf. And then it tapers in, about 3 sixteenths of an inch overall. And I, that, what that does is gives the piece a little more elegance. Now, to make that taper, I could belt sand it. I could hand plane it. I could even do it on the joiner. But I'm going to use my stationary belt sander. And just by holding the piece in a vertical position, I'll be able to give it a little bit of a taper. Okay, at last it's time for some assembly. And I want to make sure I get a nice even coat of glue in each of the mortises and also a coat on the tenons. Now this is kind of a tricky piece to put together because of the angles. All I really want to do is clamp it so that I can pin each joint with an oak dowel. Okay, now it's time to drill a hole for the oak dowel. I'm going to use a 3 8 brad point bit, and I put a piece of tape on it to tell me how deep to drill. bit of glue on the dowel and a little bit in the hole. Okay, well, now the clamps have done their job on this side so I can remove them because the dowels are set in place and I'll put on a couple more rails. Boy, you've got to be grateful for good clamps, especially when you're trying to glue up a piece like this.
Now, this is where it gets a little interesting. I have to leave one set of rails completely loose as I install the third leg. That's I'll never get it together. Okay, this is the last pin. The glue at all the joints is cured. And now I'm sanding the dowels flush using my belt sander. After I finish that, I'll smooth everything using my random orbit sander. Okay, now in order to fasten the top to the base, I need some corner blocks. Now, they're just going to fit in there like this. They're cut at 30 degrees on each side, just made out of pine. But I also have to bevel it so that it's tipped a little bit in this direction because the rails follow the flare of the legs. So that's why I've taken my radial arm and tilted the blade, or the motor, at just under 5 degrees and swung the arm around 30 degrees. I'm pre-drilling holes for the screws that'll fasten the top. And you'll notice that I've elongated them. And that's so that the top will be able to expand and contract freely as it comes into different moisture conditions. Well, now it's time to get back to work on the top. The glue has dried overnight and I've scraped off any excess that squeezed out of the joint from the clamping. I've also taken the time to drill a little pilot hole. It's a quarter inch diameter, about three eighths of an inch deep, and it's centered on the blank. I'm gonna use that pilot hole to cut the top. It's gonna be a pivot point that I'll use over here at the bandsaw with my circle cutting jig. Now the jig is just an extension of the table. There's a center line that's perpendicular to the saw blade and you can see several holes I've already used for different diameters. Now I've set my pin in this case at 14 and 3 eighths. That'll give me a 29 inch top. Now all I have to do is set the blank over the pin. And then I'll turn the saw on, spin the blank, and I'll get a perfect circle every time. I'm using my random orbit sander to smooth up the edges of the table top, smooth those marks left by the bandsaw. I'm also going to use the same sander to do the top itself, because the joints are pretty even now, and this should finish it up quite well. <laughs> I've just eased the top and bottom edges of my table top, and I'm simply using my router, which is set up with a quarter inch rounding over bit, and I've only exposed a little bit of the cutter because I don't want the whole quarter round. Now let's take another look at our prototype. When I made the rails for the lower shelf, I rabbited them only 5 sixteenths of an inch deep. And that's because if I had gone any deeper, I would have started to interfere with the tenons removing part of that material. It also means that the shelf material or the wood can only be 5 sixteenths of an inch thick. Now, I could take 3 quarter inch stock 
run it through my surface planer, but that would waste a lot of material. What I'm going to do is take three-quarter inch stock and re-saw it or split it right down the middle. That way I can use both pieces. To re-saw it, I'm going to use the bandsaw. I'm using a one-inch blade, and I've set up this auxiliary fence to support the board and keep it parallel with the blade. Well, I'll pass through the surface planer and I get rid of all those bandsaw marks. Now, with all the pieces for the shelf carefully fitted, and actually I left a little room around the edges so that it can expand, I've just dropped them in place, no glue, just some three quarter inch brads to hold them. Now I'll just take the base, flip it over onto my top. Get it positioned on some marks that I made and fasten it with some one and a quarter inch screws. Ooh. Now that 220 sandpaper really makes a smooth surface. But before I take this outside for a cricket game, I guess I better put a coat of finish on it. Now, for our cricket table, we decided we wanted sort of a pickled oak or a limed oak look. So I've chosen an oil-based stain that's called silver birch. It has a little bit of a green tint to it. I think it kind of makes the oak look nice. Boy, I'm really pleased the way the stain turned out on this piece. It gives the wood a nice, rich look. Now that I've got the stain just right, I'm protecting everything with several coats of a hard and durable satin finish polyurethane. You know, when I started to sketch out this project on paper, everybody said, why bother? There's so few cricket matches around here. But now that I've built it, everybody wants one. Thank you for watching. For more, please like and subscribe.